Uh, great. Uh, so our, um, our next speaker is Kevin Gomez uh, from Vanderbilt University, and he'll be speaking on bounds for coefficients of the FQ mock theta function and applications to partition mix. Uh, thank you, Professor Thorne. Uh, as you said, uh, my name is Kevin Gomez. I'm a third year undergraduate student uh, at Vanderbilt University. Uh, and this work was completed with, uh, uh, it was joint work with Eric Zhu, who is currently a fourth year undergraduate student at Georgia Tech University. Uh, and this was completed at the 2020 RU in number theory at Texas A&M University uh, over the summer. And uh, yeah, so I'll just be speaking about uh, the results we obtained from that and just kind of all that good stuff. All right, so uh, just a you know just quick quick refresher. We have that a partition is simply a multi set of positive integers, um, where we have that uh, all of the elements sum to some specified uh, positive integer n. Um, by convention, we might order these such that they're in uh, descending order, and such that we can then define what you might call the rank of the partition to be simply the largest part of that partition minus its number of parts. You can kind of see visually on something like a Farage diagram how this might appear uh, in a more combinatorial way. And indeed, the rank of the partition was originally devised by Dyson as a way to hope to explain the Ramanujan congruences, which you can see on the bottom right there. Very famous congruences that the partition function demonstrates. And uh, both fortunately and unfortunately, the rank when it was devised could only explain uh, the first two, i.e. in uh, the congruences modulo five and seven. Um, so later, other uh, statistics such as the crank were developed to uh, deal with mod 11 case. Uh, but at any rate, the rank in its own right is still a very nice and very important statistic. Um, and so uh, our work kind of focused on analyzing uh, different kinds of ranks. Specifically, um, we were interested in uh, even and odd ranks. So if we have n, r, t, n being the number of partitions of n with rank even or odd, uh, congruent to r mod t in the general case. And if we consider n0, 2 and n1, 2, we get ranks that are even or odd. And then we have a conjecture of how and Jaka Deason, such that if, is that we have this uh, convexity results, essentially for the uh, rank counting function that uh, nr2a times nr2b is going to be bigger than nr2a plus b for a b bigger than, in this case, uh, some explicit constants around about 12. Um, the, the paper where uh, Howe and Jagadisan presented this result or this conjecture uh, was in the same paper in which they proved the analogous conjecture for t equals three. Uh, but the techniques they applied were uh, far more analytic in nature and they couldn't quite extend all the way down to the two, t equals two case. So in order to uh, resolve uh, this, con uh, this conjecture, we kind of had to take a different kind of approach, um, which was uh, mainly motivated by our uh, primary advisor, uh, Dr. Riyad Masri at Texas A&M University. And it all uh, centers on uh, the FQ mock theta function, which is an order three mock theta function originally devised by Ramanujan, uh, which is given by um, that infinite sum there but has a particularly pleasant uh, Fourier expansion, Fourier expansion, which simply relates the difference between even and odd rank partitions uh, very cleanly. And, and as you can see, you know, with it being such an early entry in the OEIS, this is going to be a pretty important sequence. And so if we attempt to analyze alpha of n as a sequence of Fourier coefficients, we can get much better understanding of the difference between uh, the even and odd rank functions. Uh, a remarkable theorem of Bringman and Ono uh, demonstrates the result you see there, um, which connects some uh, certain twisted Klusterman type sums um, to get an exact formula for alpha of n. But uh, this formula is not um, immediately useful for uh, resolving the conjecture of how in Jagadisan, primarily because it does not converge absolutely. So we do have to find another approach. And uh, through that approach, we were able to obtain um, good asymptotics uh, for alpha of n, specifically um, effective error terms. Um, we have uh, d of n is effectively a discriminant. Um, then we have this uh, alternating main term and then an error term that with an effective bound, um, which notably agrees with the k equals one term of the Bringman-Ono summation. So uh, 
yes, this is going uh, this is going to be kind of the primary building block from which we obtain both our uh, demonstration of the conjecture as well as some other nice corollaries that follow from it as well, which I'll be discussing. So how do we how do we how do we do our approach? So we're kind of taking a bit more of an algebraic approach to this problem, and uh, we'll see in a minute why this is even possible in this case. Um, if we let Q, D, N be a set of positive definite uh, quadratic forms for A, B, and C uh, integers, um, we have some restrictions on uh, the uh, residues of A and B mod N and two N. A form is reduced if B, uh, absolute value B is less than A, less than C. Um, and then we can also call a form primitive if uh, the greatest, if all those coefficients are relatively prime. All right, now the, these sets will become uh, very important later. Uh, and to each of these forms, we associate uh, a Heidner point, which is simply just a root of QX1 uh, if positive imaginary parts, so in the uh, upper half plane. Um, and with this foundation, we can consider the congruent subgroup gamma naught of n, uh, uh, which can act on both of these sets. Um, the actions are compatible with the Heidner points in the sense that if we act on the Heidner point, then that's just the same thing as taking the Heidner point of the quadratic form with the action already applied. And uh, this, again, this whole technique was mostly uh, motivated by our uh, advisor, Mas uh, Professor Mastery. Um, and uh, a similar technique was applied to uh, resolve uh, Chen's inequalities for the Andrews SPT function. And this was done by Dossi and Mastery, um, I think in 2018. So, all of this, all of this algebra wouldn't necessarily be helpful, though, if we didn't have some way to bring it back. And that's uh, using the, uh, the uh, result due to uh, Brunier and Schwagenscheidt, um, which is that uh, alpha of n can be given as a finite algebraic sum, uh, as a, a trace over this particular uh, weight zero modular form on gamma naught of six. Um, and again, this is a very interesting result. Uh, it doesn't, we don't really have similar results like it for uh, other ranks. And so the fact that we have this and the ability to use it is really striking and important. Um, and so we are going to make use of it um, where we can decompose it um, over primitive forms using some uh, class polynomial relations. Um, and this allows us to kind of further break it down and hopefully extract the main term. Um, and this entire sum is going to involve certain right coset representatives of gamma naught of six, specifically those gamma sub Q are effectively, uh, there's, it's a finite set of representatives and to each quadratic form an appropriate representative is um, associated with it. Okay. And when we do this, this allows us to take our modular form, which we can uh, find a Fourier expansion at the cusp infinity and map it to the other cusps. Uh, and when we do this, we get this uh, general form with coefficients a of n. There's an explicit uh, description of a of n as well. That's a bit too complicated to go into right now. Um, but notably, we are able to bound these uh, coefficients uh, uh, so that we can uh, try to extract the main term of these uh, Fourier expansions. Uh, and so when we do this, we can then again take our trace and split it up a bit more. Um, we end up extracting some error terms, which are mostly just uh, specific quadratic forms that we're going to be summing over that are easy to handle and are well behaved. Um, and then the main term falls out uh, when we consider uh, quadratic forms with uh, small uh, with small uh, choice of uh, a, small choice of small uh, first coefficient, and uh, particular choices of the width of the uh, the cusp. And this is how we get our main term, uh, which is effectively e to the pi root dn over 12. Um, now you would expect actually that uh, initially it actually has a uh, main growth term of uh, e to the pi dn over six, but it turns out that uh, the modular form, uh, sorry, not modular forms, the quadratic forms that would contribute to that are actually summed to zero, um, which is, act which is uh, pretty important to have uh, that uh, these alpha n coefficients uh, grow at a much reduced rate. And so this is all it takes to get our main results. Uh, but once we have it, we can get uh, so many other nice uh, corollaries from it. Um, the, the first of which is kind of simple application to getting uh, growth rates for uh, NR2N. Again, if we have uh, a nice little main term growth rate here, 
then uh, we can again effectively bound our error term. Um, and this is originally due to a uh, effective bound on the partition function that was uh, done by Lemmer. Um, and combining it, um, again, we're able to obtain nice asymptotics for uh, the rank counting function. Um, another nice corollary that we get is that um, for similarly n bigger than or equal to four, we are able to obtain um, asymptotic, uh, or not asymptotic, effective equidistribution of the ranks modulo two. So again, if we take the ratio, we get that it is one half with an effective error term. Um, asymptotic equidistribution, equidistribution of the ranks modulo two was already shown by both males uh, and uh, MLS and mastery, the latter having a power saving error term. Um, but this is uh, an effective result, which is uh, something we weren't necessarily expecting, but uh, kind of makes sense in hindsight that it would fall out as a similar result, given that uh, we were trying to obtain effective bounds for alpha then. All right. And so now that we actually have um, the main growth term for uh, NR2N, we can now uh, attempt to resolve the conjecture uh, completely. So we first kind of uh, have this lemma here that puts NR2N into a nice window, uh, which is useful for uh, showing the convexity. Um, and this lemma follows pretty easily from um, inequality on the uh, effective bound on the error term. We simply have to find the n such that um, uh, we have this term is bigger than the explicit constant. And this turns out to hold for all n bigger than uh, 4,543. With the remaining um, n, all the smaller n, check using the OEIS. So as we saw earlier, the OEIS has the coefficients alpha of n, and also has the, obviously has the partition function, p of n. And so we can take both those sequences, uh, use those to obtain n0 to n and n1 to n, and just simply verify that they all fall into these windows, which is uh, significantly faster than computing these coefficients um, on the fly using something like Sage. Uh, so this turned out to be a uh, fairly effective technique. And then once we have this lemma, the resolution of the conjecture is not too hard. Um, we consider a b bigger than or equal to 11, writing b as c times a for some constant c bigger than one. And we effectively need to show this inequality um, shown, shown here, which again, through some very simple manipulations, we can kind of uh, work our way down to show that the re relation holds for all A bigger than or equal to 18. And then if you put some bounds on C, C being, uh, needing to be a bit bigger, then we have uh, results all the way down to A equals 11. And the remaining 16 cases or so are checked just manually once again with, a, with computer in uh, Sage Math. So that is uh, how, you res uh, how we resolve the conjecture of Howe and Jagadisan, uh, which is great. But um, there are still some open questions we might be able to ask about this. So we've got the result for t equals two and Howe and Jagadisan had a very similar result for t equals three, but what about t greater than or equal to four? Um, again, Malis uh, demonstrated that the result holds for any t uh, with a b sufficiently large um, in his paper, but the existence of some explicit constant C of T that could, we could use to bound A and B from below would uh, be would provide an effective results, which is uh, kind of the goal. Um, again, the fact that we were even able to get this result is really contingent on the finite algebraic formula due to Brunier and Schwagenscheidt. So if, cert if similar algebraic formulas were able to be found, um, then this would uh, we could apply very similar techniques to obtain um, similar results for larger t. Although there all, would be other considerations that have to be made, no, na uh, notably the number of quadratic forms that are contributing to the main term would get larger and larger as t increases. So uh, other techniques would need to be uh, developed to kind of come up with a more uh, generic way to handle uh, these, uh, these finite sums. So uh, yes, uh, that's pretty much the entirety. Uh, again, we had some other results that we discuss uh, in our paper uh, on the whole thing, uh, same title. So uh, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, questions for the speaker? Can I see your main result one more time? 
Uh, I'm, uh, yes. The min, the conjecture. The conjecture, yes. Here we are. Yeah. First of all, it's great result, amazing result. And second thing, I just want to make a comment. So this is a convexity. And yesterday, I think there is a Zach, a Zach trip gave a talk on the log concavity. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I saw that your er error bounds are kind of has a square root of saving from the main terms, the so square root of main term almost. So the main yes. term of the size of e to the power ln and the error mm -hmm. terms look like e to the power e, e to the power ln over two, the size. Yes. I was wondering that uh, you can also talk about log concavity. What I'm trying to say, mm -hmm. so in so you have a nr two a time nr two b greater than nr two a plus b, right? Yes. So maybe instead of looking nr two a plus one time nr two a minus one is a greater or less? I don't know. Nr two a square. Okay, so mm. the log concavity type of result. So this okay, is yeah, more, yeah. I was wondering. I think. Maybe that can be doable something. Uh, yeah, that does seem like it wouldn't be too far off from here. I think uh, so, yeah. It's because yeah. these two results kind of go parallelly using the similar techniques. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm wondering that if you guys already look at that problem or maybe take a look um, at that. We did not ex uh, look at it at the time, but it does feel like something that would follow quite nicely. Um, I think uh, we... we uh, the entire RU process is a bit of a time crunch, so uh, we can only, you know, handle so many problems. But uh, yeah, that, no, that does feel like something that we could get pretty easily from here. Yeah, it's a great result. Yeah, amazing. Thank you. Uh, so I have a question. Uh, so mm -hmm. you have these very explicit uh, numerical constants um, that occur. Uh, you know, which is great. You know. Usually people just write less than less than and here everything is totally <laughs> explicit. If you felt like uh, improving these, like how much messier would the algebra get? Um, yes. Um, so, right, let me find some, some of the constants I can talk about. Um, let's see here. So for some of these corollaries, um, well, I, guess the, I guess the constants for these corollaries are really contingent on uh, this main constant here on E of n, um, which, if I recall, is um, obta uh, obtained very similarly to how uh, you obtain the constant, uh, the effective constant that Dossie and Master used for the Andrews SPT function. And again, thinking back to ha having to do this myself, um, you do have to get a lot more particular with the quadratic forms and how you you know, how you're kind of grouping them together in the right mm -hmm. sums. So this was probably about the best we could get without some really, you know, close analysis. Um, mm -hmm. This, I mean, uh, obtaining the error, uh, the main term in its own right already required, um, there's a, so if we look, right, yeah, so if we look here, um, we have that, uh, uh, we, uh, one thing, uh, one term that's important here is uh, h sub q, the width of the cost gamma q infinity. And uh, the, the, the quadratic forms we sieve out are basically dependent on aq, so the coefficient a times hq, mm -hmm. or the width of the cusp. And those are going to be divisible by six. So if you pick out the ones equal to six, those sum to zero. If you pick out the ones equal to 12, you get the main term. But to look any, but um, the ones that uh, have aq, hq equal to six were already known. I think they were found. Uh, or listed kind of explicitly by De, uh, Demerti, I believe. Uh, finding the ones with a, uh, a times h equal to 12 was a bit harder. I had to spend some time doing that. And find the ones with, say, equal to 18, which would be the next step up, I imagine is even more, just based on like you know, the, the growth rate of the number of terms. Mm -hmm. So kind of challenging, but I suppose doable. OK, all right. Oh, excellent, thank you. Other questions? Uh, uh, so I think everyone see the chat. Uh, Joshua Melsi wrote, uh, thank, is, thanks, Kevin and Toll is a really cool talk. Just want to read it out from the chat. OK, so just one comment. Uh, if you uh, would like your slides to be posted to the Discord, uh, uh, you can either do that yourself or email me and I'll do it for you.
Okay, uh, I can upload them, yeah. Uh, all right, great. Uh, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you. We'll stop share. Oh, let me stop everybody.